Oh, hallelujah. Good morning, Word of God. Can we stand together as we reverence the reading of His Word? If you have your Bibles, if you would, turn with me to 1 Corinthians. I want to go to the 11th chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. So it was one year ago that we started a study in Genesis called the Genesis Prophecies, and we were in that for some time. And I had shared with you that I, I, I felt like the Lord was leading me for us to go to Exodus next. And we, we did some other messages in between, but we are now in the study of Exodus, and Lord willing, we'll leave Exodus and go to Joshua. But I am excited about what this book is filled with, and to kind of set it up, I actually want to look at something that Jesus said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and when you get over there, just say amen. We've had two very intense services this morning, and uh, welcome to the third service. Here we go. Uh, I'm, I'm ready to get in this one more time. It's been an exciting morning, just, just, just seeing God's word unfold, and I'm in expectation of what he's going to do in this service, because every service is not necessarily an exact repeat of the, of, of the previous one. I try to, you know, I'm, I'm following the same plan, but sometimes there's an interruption. All right. First Corinthians chapter 11, if you're there, just say amen. We'll look at it in verse number 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. So when he gave them the bread, notice what he said about it. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it. And then he says the same thing again. In remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show, you do manifest, you do represent the Lord's death till he come. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the ministry of your Holy Spirit and that by your spirit we have an ear to hear. And I ask, Father, that by your Holy Spirit that you would bless our hearing and that we would receive revelation knowledge. And Lord, you would open your word to us, perhaps in a way we have not seen before. And we ask you for understanding of your word, that you would give us a conviction of truth. We ask you for words of faith. We ask you for words of salvation. Lord, I ask right now, Father, that you would override my premeditated thought, that you would speak to me words that you would have spoken, that your spirit would speak by me, that your word would be on my tongue that you would make my tongue the pen of a ready writer, that I could write on the hearts and minds of these, your people, your anointed word, removing their burdens and destroying their yokes forever. As we boldly declare that, Satan is defeated, we are redeemed, and Jesus is Lord in Jesus' name. If you would, greet somebody around you, Shreveport, Boja, before you take your seats this morning. Well, let's get into it. Take a neighbor, let's get into it. We're studying the book of Exodus. A year ago, we picked up a study in Genesis, and now we, we've come to Exodus, and we're not going to necessarily follow every book of the Bible unless the Lord leads me or leads us to, uh, but we've talked about this for some time, and I'm excited about what we're getting into. And if you're taking notes, ultimately what I feel like we need to establish early on in this study uh, and all that's going to come out of Exodus is seeing the what. What did God do in Exodus? He brought his children out of bondage. He brought his children out of captivity. But why did he do it? He did it so that they could have a relationship with him. And I think in every aspect of our life, it is important that we not only recognize the what in the things that God does and the things that we do, but to recognize the why. 
Because behind every what, there is a motive. And the motive is the why. What I want us to do today as we open up his word is to treat his word like a puzzle. My mom used to love puzzles. She worked them all the time. And in a puzzle, you put all the pieces on the table and then you start categorizing, you know, this is the sky, we'll put this over here. and This is that brick wall, I'll put this over here and you start putting it together. And, and treat these verses we're gonna read like pieces to a puzzle that hopefully by the end of this message, an image will have been formed and an understanding will have, have come forward. There's something I want us to see about Jesus' words here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And these are the, the words that the Apostle Paul was given by the Lord that he's communicating to the church. And it's in regards to communion, what we call the Lord's Supper or the Lord's Table, and how that the bread and the cup represent the body and blood of Jesus and that any time we eat of that bread and drink of that cup, we're supposed to do so in remembrance of him. But make no mistake about it, this is the Lord's table, this is the Lord's supper, this is what we call communion. And we're told that as often as we eat this bread and as often as we drink this cup, to do so in remembrance of the Lord. What's interesting about this uh, chapter and this letter to, to, to the Corinthian church is you back up one chapter, he, he, he mentions Exodus. He mentions the children of Israel coming out of Egypt and shows us in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 10 that all the things that happen in Exodus are, are our example. We're supposed to learn from what God did. So let's put that piece on the table. If you would, turn back with me to Exodus, and I want to go to the fifth chapter, Exodus chapter number five. Let's revisit again the what, what God did, and then let's look into the why. Why did he do it? Exodus is a book of exiting. It's a book of deliverance. It's a book that reveals the heart of God, that it is not the will of the Father that any man be in bondage, that any man be oppressed, that God's not called us to live in bondage and he is against bondage and he is against slavery and he is for freedom, hallelujah. And so this, this book illustrates God's heart to liberate men from captivity and bondage. The children of Israel were in bondage in Egypt for 400 years and God in Exodus is gonna bring them out. That's what he did. And there's so many things that we're gonna see in this book but I don't want to go deep into the study of this book and not know why he did it because it was more than just bringing the children of Israel out of bondage. There was a why behind it. And this illustrates for you and I salvation because I'm telling you, Jesus is all over Exodus. Exodus is a book that was written by Moses. The Spirit of God gave the book to Moses. But Jesus said in John 3 and in John 5, that, if we, that, that Moses wrote of him. And this is a story of what Jesus came to do for us. We all have our own Egypts. We all have our own bondages that we need deliverance from. And one bondage that is true for every human being is the bondage of sin. And there is none of us without sin. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And sin is bondage, addiction. It is bondage. And God's called us to be free. And Jesus comes to give us this freedom. And I want to show it to you in Exodus chapter 5. If you're there, just say amen. We'll look at it in verse 1. And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh... Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, let my people go. Come on, somebody. Let my people go. He's telling Pharaoh, let my people go. That's what he's requiring. That's what he's demanding. That's what he was going to do. As a matter of fact, he had already declared before this day that Israel was going to come out of Egypt. Back in Genesis chapter 15, God told Abraham, 
that his descendants would end up in bondage, end up in Egypt, but that he would stretch forth his arm and he would demonstrate his power and that he would bring them out of Egypt. So before the children of Israel even got word through Moses that God was going to bring them out, God had already declared that he was going to bring them out. God already spoke it 400 years earlier that he was going to bring the children of Israel out. And the time had come and God sent his word to Pharaoh, let my people go. That's the what. That's the what that God was requiring. But notice the why in verse 1. Read it with me, Shreveport and Bozier. The rest of that statement in verse 1. That they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. So let them go that they may hold a feast unto me. We're going to have a celebration. We are going to have a fellowship. We are going to have a feast, a literal feast in the wilderness. He said, I'm going to have that with my people. And right now, them being in bondage is preventing them from coming to my table. It's preventing them from fellowshipping with me. And this just drives home this point that is, through, that is true not only through Exodus, it is true throughout the Bible that salvation is more than just my being delivered from something. It's more than just my deliverance and forgiveness of sin and being delivered from death and the grave and being delivered from bondage, if that wasn't enough. Salvation is more to being saved from a thing. And, and what I feel like so many of us have missed, I missed, is that salvation is about what I've been saved to. It's an exchange that God has brought me out of bondage so that I can enjoy the benefits of his salvation and what it's like to do life with him. How many of us know not only what God has saved us from, but what he has saved us to and what he has saved us from is sin. And what's so dangerous and deadly about sin is that according to Romans 3.23, sin separates me from the glory of God, the essence of who he is, fellowship with him, knowing him, walking with him, talking to him, hearing from him, having a relationship with him. If you were asked to identify or to define eternal life, and don't answer this out loud, but if you were asked to define eternal life, and you said, okay, eternal life, how would I define it? And we, might, we might all say dying and going to heaven. You know, we might have our own definition of what eternal life is. But Jesus said in John 17, verse 3, Jesus defined eternal life. And in John 17, verse 3, Jesus said, this is life eternal. Here's what it is. He said, it is to know the one true God. It is to know the Father. It is to be in a relationship with the Father. And I don't really have life until I have been reconciled with the heart of the Father. That's eternal life. It's more than my name written in heaven. It, it, you don't marry somebody for their house. You shouldn't enter into a relationship because of where they live. I know my wife didn't marry me for my house when we got married, but, but, but she married me, not my house. And, and so many believers are turning to, to faith and salvation only because they want heaven when they die. But there's more to life than heaven. There's a relationship with the one that made heaven. There's a relationship with the one who is the preeminent figure in heaven. And it's a father who loves me so much that he gave his son, not so that I could just be in heaven, but that I could have a relationship with him. And I feel like man-made religion has caused so many to leave one form of bondage and to go into a new form of bondage. And God's not called me out of my sin and out of darkness to enter into a religion. He's called me out of my darkness and out of my deception and out of my sin to enter into a relationship with him. Life is all about a relationship with the Father that so many people are, are alienated from. They don't know. And that relationship doesn't have to come through a building with a steeple on top. And that relationship doesn't have to come through a man in the earth that calls himself a priest or a pastor or any. I don't need a man to be my mediator. 
Thank God for pastors and teachers and ministers and spiritual leaders and elders. God has called us to have them in our life. We're supposed to have people that speak into our life. Hebrews 13 verses 7 and 17 says, Obey them that have the rule over you, who have fed you the word of God, for they watch after your soul. I need people that the Lord can use to speak into my life. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is, is that when it comes to prayer and me talking to the Father, I don't have to go find anybody. I have an advocate with the Father. I can speak to him at any place. I can speak to him at any time in my car, in my kitchen, in my bed, in my closet, out in the yard, riding on a riding mower. There's no place I can go that I can't talk to my Father. I have a relationship with him. I have an advocate with the Father, and Jesus has become my mediator. He's become the one that stands between the Father and me, and he speaks to the Father on my behalf, and he speaks to me on behalf of the Father. Jesus is my mediator. Relationship that so many miss. So the book of Exodus is not just what God did in bringing his children out of bondage. It's why. So that they could have a feast. He called, I didn't call it that. He called it that. He said, I want to have a feast. I want to have a feast. Hey, what you say? I like feasts. That includes food. I want to have a feast. So if you would, come over to chapter 6. So he says in verse 5, I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. God remembers his covenant, as we talked about last week. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rid you of their bondage. I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. Now, God could have brought the children of Israel out any way he wanted to. But he did it in a certain way that communicated not only to the children of Israel, It communicated to the hierarchy in the land of Egypt. So when Moses went in and told Pharaoh, let God's people go that they may hold a feast. Pharaoh said not only, as a matter of fact, Pharaoh asked the question. You can see it back in chapter 5, verse 2. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord? See, he doesn't know. He said, who is the Lord? That I should obey his voice. Oh, come on, somebody. This is what Pharaoh said. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? So God was like, okay, Pharaoh, you don't know who I am. Let me show you who I am. So Pharaoh had said, you'll never hear a frog. You'll never hear the sound of a frog in Egypt because of their mighty crocodile God. Pharaoh said that the sun was a god and and, and reserved its own day, sun, S-U-N day. Pharaoh said the moon was a god, and we have a moon day called Monday that's false religion that came out of Babel that was inherited and came out of Egypt. And Pharaoh said that the Nile River was a god, and there was no river and no waters like the Nile. And Pharaoh said that he was a god, and God said, let me answer your gods, and I'll show you this but one god. You say the crocodile is a god, and there'll never be a frog in Egypt. Let me plague your land with frogs so I can show you your gods cannot stand up against me. Let me tell you who the god of light is and he darkened the sun and the moon and the stars and they couldn't see anything. God said the Nile is no God at all and he turned it to blood and it provided no water and no life to its inhabitants because God was sending a message not only to the children of Israel but to Pharaoh who thought he was God. There is but one God and when I say my people are coming out, I will demonstrate to you that they will come out at my word. Isn't it awesome that even when we didn't know the Lord, he was demonstrating his arm and his salvation for me? Before I knew the Lord, he was already at work in my life. Before I turned to him, he was already doing things for me. There are things that God will do for you to show you who he is, and you don't even know him. 
Are y'all hearing what I'm saying, do you? Oh, Ruth, Ruth, a Gentile woman, comes into the land of Bethlehem, the land of the Jews. And she's, she's a Gentile and she's poor. And God's law required that if you owned a field, when you gleaned that field, when you pulled the fruit off the branches, you couldn't go back through and pick up what you left behind. If you didn't pick it, you can't pick it again. The poor were allowed to come in behind the field owner's servants and then grab what was left behind and go to the four corners. And Ruth comes walking in Boaz's field one day and she's finding baskets of fruit left behind. She meant to pick it. And she just picked up the basket and said, thank you. Put that in her wagon. A little bit further, another basket. Well, okay, I believe I received. Put that in her wagon. She went home that evening to her mother-in-law, Naomi. You can read this in the book of Ruth. And Naomi looked at what the, the bounty that she had. And, 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 and Naomi had been doing this long enough. No, wait a minute. <laughs> they ain't leave that much behind. She said this to Naomi. She said, you've been left handfuls of purpose. This is intentional. This is on purpose. This was no coincidence. This ain't luck. This was intentional. And I don't know about you, but I can say this about me, even in my young life before I accepted Christ. The Lord was doing things for me that was intentional. That, that you can say it was a coincidence, but God was doing something intentional. And I don't have time this morning to go through all the things that I saw in my, in my young life before I accepted Christ that when I looked back on, I was like, wow, God was doing things that I didn't even ask for. God was doing things when I didn't even believe on him. God was doing things when I wasn't even praying. He was doing things for me because he knew what his plan for me was, and he was showing me even before I knew him that he was all-powerful. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying to you? So God said, let me show you each of what I'm capable of. Because I don't want to just bring you out. I want to bring you out with faith in me. And I want your enemies to know who I am. God will use your enemy as your footstool. Let, don't worry about what your enemy has said. It'll never happen. God will, God will use that as a platform. Oh. Don't let your enemy tell you what can't happen. God will let that thing happen. Just let them know they ain't God. Y'all done stirred me up this morning. So God said, I want, I want, I, 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 let my people go, Pharaoh. Let them go. You think you're a God? Let me show you who God is. So Pharaoh got ignorant. He said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to not only, I'm not only not going to let them go, I'm going to make their job harder. The Egyptians were providing the straw for the hay. And Pharaoh says, since you asked me to let them go, I'm going to make their workload harder. And they're going to have to go find their own hay. Don't be surprised when you start and that may be you today watching live or here where you, you begin to entertain faith in the Lord. And all of a sudden the enemy turns up the heat. Jesus said when they had heard the word, Satan comes immediately. Don't think that you can begin to live for the Lord and live for his word and the enemy not test that and say, you know what, you know what? Let, me, let, me, let me turn up the heat. Let him turn up the heat. The trial always comes before the glory. And the greater the trial, the greater the glory. Hang on and wait and watch what the Lord is going to do. Don't you give up. Don't you cave in. Don't you quit. Don't you retreat. The enemy's trying to talk you in to going back into Egypt. No, no, no. There's something better on the other side of this. So go with me to Exodus 25. Exodus 25. So God said, let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me. Let my people go that we may have a celebration, a, a meal. Uh, I want them to come to my table. Oh, hallelujah. See, they're being saved from something to something. I'm being saved from something, not just for the sake of being out of it. I'm being saved from something to something. 
I didn't even know when I got saved. I'm being real. I, I did not know when I got saved. I knew what I was saved from. I had no idea what he was saving me to. Man, if I'd have known what he was saving me to then, man, don't tell me what I would have done. Good, goobala goo, man. I knew I was saved. I knew he forgave me my sins. I knew I was going to heaven when I died. I believed that. I believed the gospel. I had no idea that not only had he, had he come to give me eternal life, but that he had an abundant life for me. I, didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I couldn't even begin to fathom with the, the script the Lord had written for my life. That not only was he saving me from my mess, from my sin, from the, the, who I was, who did James, he was saving me to a person I could have never fathomed. I could not have imagined this walk that I would have with the Father. Hallelujah. So watch this in Exodus 25. So God said, uh, uh, I want you to, uh, you will let my people go and they're gonna hold a feast. We're gonna have dinner. Man, that's awesome. God said, let them go. Right, we're gonna have a dinner date. I'm inviting them to my table. Think about how many first dates. Think about the first date. You know, the first date. So many, so often a first date is, hey, would you go to lunch with me? Would you go to dinner with me? Why are y'all so quiet? <laughs> you know, you, you have, a, you have a, a setting at a table. Think about the way many of us were raised. At least I was. You were raised that in the evening you went to the table. And it wasn't no if. You know, I'm not hungry. It doesn't matter if you're hungry. The table was more than your hunger. Matter of fact, when I grew up and you went to the table, when you got through eating, you didn't leave the table. You may remember the way it used to be. you say, may I be excused? But, but typically, nine out of ten times in my house, my dad would have said, no, you may not be excused. How did your day go? What's going on in your life? What did you learn in school today? See, the table was about an experience. And, and for my wife and I, you know, we, we have a, a, this rule with our table is that no phones at the table. Because the table is more than the food. The table is the fellowship. The table is the communion. The communion. The communion. God wanted the communion with his people around the table. Are y'all with me? Some time ago, I felt like the Lord gave me this word. And it is based on scripture because Jesus asked Peter three times if he loved him. And three times Peter said, yes, Lord, I love you. Yes, Lord, I love you. Yes, Lord, I love you. And after the third time, he's like, Lord, you know, you know everything. You know if I love you or not. Why do you keep asking me this? And then Jesus said this, if you love me, feed my lambs. And the Lord gave me a conviction. We feed what we love. You feed what you love. My mama would cook and love cook and love feeding. When we got through eating, she'd take leftovers down to shut-ins. And one day I met this, this chef. That, man, he could cook. Oh, he could cook. He's in heaven now. Oh, he could cook. And I went to him one day, and I said, man, what is it about your cooking? It reminds me of my mama. And he looked back at me, and I'll never forget. He said, Pastor, I cook with love. I said, man, that sounds like something my mama would say. He said, that's the only thing I can say. I cook with love. I just love feeding people. And you feed what you love. And God said, I'm going to bring you out, and I'm going to feed you. I'm going to feed you. Even in the wilderness, I'm going to feed you because I feed what I love. So next time somebody serves you something you can't eat, say, Adam, why you hate me so much? <laughs> I need the salt, the pepper, and the love, please. Could you, put, could you put some love on it? <laughs> Come on now. So God said, God said, I, 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 I'm calling you to a feast. I'm calling you to a dinner. I'm calling you to a, a place of communion. I, 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 I'm, I'm going to feed you. I'm going to feed you. But it was more than the bread. Let me show what I'm talking about. Watch this in Exodus chapter 25. If you're there, say amen. Verse 22, he says, and there, he's talking about the tabernacle that he was calling Moses to build. The tabernacle we'll deal with more later. But in verse 22, he says, and there I will meet with thee, and I will what? Commune with thee. So we get the word communion. Communication, communicate over a table, over food, over a feast. 
So God brought the children of Israel out of bondage, and he's telling Moses to build this tabernacle, this tent, this house of God, and notice what he wants in his house. Look at it in verse 23. Thou shalt also make a what? Table. He said, make me a table. Make me a table. Make me a table. Put a table in my house. God said, put me a table in my house. Now, they would never physically see God at that table, but that table communicated something. So he said, make me a table. And he, and then he says in verse 24, overlay it with gold. I want a gold table made of pure gold. Overlay it with pure gold. Put a crown of gold round about it. Verse 25. And thou shalt make unto it a border of a hand breadth round about. Man, it's got a big old bowl, beautiful border of gold. And thou shalt make a golden crown to the border thereof round about. Man, it's a fancy table. And, thou, and then he said, put some rings in it with golden staves that they can be easily moved because this tabernacle would journey with the children of Israel. And, and then he says in, in uh, verse number 29, uh, or, or 20, uh, yeah, 28, he says, uh, 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 29, and thou shalt make the dishes thereof. God said, give me some dishes. Wasn't no paper plates. He said, give me some dishes. The kind of dishes you saw in your grandmother's house that you were never able to use. They were reserved for the hutch. You go stay with grandmother and you grab some off there. That, put that, that, that's, my, that's my china. Man, I had family members that you couldn't even go in their dining room. I was like, what we got this room for? You can't even go in there. I walk in, you know, to my mom, I got my dining room, got my dining room. I'm like, oh man, what kind of room is this? Is that the holy place? What is this? Who knows what I'm talking about? We back in the day, man, you, hey. It was serious, man. That was like a holy thing. You couldn't touch them dishes. You don't know Thanksgiving. Well, you better put my china back up. So God said, "I, I want some. Uh, I want. I want some. I want some. Uh, some. Some dishes on it. Put some dishes on my table. Spoons. Look at verse one. Spoons. Covers. 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 Put a tablecloth on my table." And I want it to be made of pure gold. I want it to be gold. It's going to be an elaborate uh, uh, tablecloth on my golden table. And I want bowls on the table. What you say. And verse 30, I want you to make sure you put some bread before me always. Don't ever have my table without any bread. And it can't be just bread that's been left over. It's got to be bread that's fresh every day. And one of the priest's responsibilities was, was to make sure that every day there was fresh bread on that table. What was God saying? He was saying to the children of Israel... I give you a table because I offer you fellowship. I give you a table because I offer you communion. Notice that God brought the children of Israel out of bondage and he builds this house. And right when you walk in the front room, it was a three, we'll deal with this later, but there, it's a three room house. It's the outer court, the inner court, and the holy place. And when you leave the outer court, which is like the, you know, the outside of the house, the gate, the porch, when you get in the first room, the first thing you see is this table. What is God saying? I want to fellowship with you. I want to have a relationship with you. I want my table to always have fresh bread on it. And Jesus said, when we pray, uh, we, 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 you know, give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. But, but it's more than the bread. Because look, look at where the, the bread was, was placed. The, 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 the bread was placed it, 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 on a table that was prepared. Hey, what you say? The table was prepared where the bread was set. And the 23rd Psalm, God said, I prepare a table for you and I'll do it even in the presence of your enemy. Your enemy doesn't get to sit at the table, but they'll see you seated there. Do you know if you have enemies, you need a table? Thou preparest a table in the presence of my enemies. 
If your enemy is in your head, if the enemy is in your mind, if the enemy is in your life, do you know being seated at the right table could change everything in your life? Having the right conversation, having the right fellowship, being around people that love you, being around people that have your back. That's why family time around a table is so important. It's why we need to put our phones down. We all have enemies, and we need to, we need to be together at the table with God in his presence so that we can be delivered from our enemies. Yesterday morning early, I got up because we got this big old pig, big pig. The person that sold it to us said it was a mini pig. Lied like a Persian rug. <laughs> this pig is huge. And he'd been sticking his head down and busting through the, the fence of, of, uh, in my wife's uh, where she keeps her prized goats. And he wants to eat with the goats and sleep with the goats, be treated like a goat. But he's messing up the goat, the goat bar. We, we got to get him out. Now, his formal name for company when they come over and see the pig, his formal name is Winston. <laughs> I can't tell you what we call him. <laughs> My wife is here today. She don't want that out. But we got his own name. He'd been born under the fence, so I got up early, went to the Home Depot. I got some stuff. I said, I'm going to get rid of this pig. Ain't getting back in here. And my wife's prize goes, no more. I'm going to stop there. I went by the QT to gas up, went in there, and they had some donuts. I said, man, let me go and get some donuts. Got a half a dozen donuts, and they was in a little QT bag. And so I got home, and my wife was frying bacon. Well, I might not need to fix this fence. She done took Winston out. <laughs> and the aroma of bacon was in the kitchen. You know, that's a glorious smell. And I'm in here with my little bagged up QT. No, no offense, QT, but I'm in my bag QT donuts sitting on the bar. I'm like, baby, this, uh, my stuff don't even look good with this aroma in there. She said, let me fix that. And she breaks out this, this, this uh, what do you call it thing? A, 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 a platter for like cakes. And she sets it on the bar and pulls off the little glass lid, takes my donuts out that QT bag, places them in there all pretty, puts the thing back on there. I said, man, them QT donuts are like Southern made, no? <laughs> Southern made. I've been giving you a lot of props lately now, just so, just so you know. I was like, baby, and I told her, I said, presentation is everything. And so I walked down the hall to go back outside and deal with this pig. And, and, and I was like, man, I know this is going to come out in a sermon. And I didn't know it would be the next morning. This happened yesterday. But presentation is everything. God said, keep fresh bread on my table because I'm not yesterday's God. I'm today's God. I'm not the God of the past. I'm the God of every single day. I give you daily bread because I want daily fellowship with you. I want daily time with you. It's more than just the bread. Think about it. We go to the table and we eat and we want to leave the table thinking mission accomplished, belly full. But the table is supposed to be more than just the bread bread I eat. People go to church, they think they got enough. Oh, I got enough. I'm leaving. No. It's more to than just getting you full. It is about time with God, fellowship with him. And I feel like we as believers are missing that. We know what we've been saved from, but we don't see what we've been saved to. God's got a word for you on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. He's got a fresh word. Daily bread is more than just my needs being met. Give us this day our daily bread. That bread comes with the bowls. It comes with the, the tablecloth. It comes with the golden table. It's in the house of God. He's calling me into his house where he has my bread. He's calling me into his presence where he has my bread. His presence is the master key for every issue I have in my life. And while I'm eating the bread of his word, he's communing with me, and I am communing with him. That's what it was all about. If you would, turn with me to the New Testament. Go with me to Luke 15. Luke 15. I don't know how people make it. This is not being spoken in condemnation or criticism. I'm being real because of who I am and what I face every day. 
I don't know how people make it without Jesus. Do you hear me? I, I, I'm like, I don't know how people do life without Jesus. And I'm not talking about the Jesus that shows up because I'm perfect. I'm talking about the Jesus that shows up because I'm a mess. Hello. You see me up on this platform with all these nice LED lights and it, it, this, suit, this suit look good there. It's kind of clean. <laughs> Messing with you. But man, the, 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 you pull back the layers of all of our lives, there's a mess in there. I mean, I, I, deal, I have to deal with me every day. Deal with my mind, deal with my mess, deal with my emotions, deal with my, with my flesh, deal with my past, deal with my challenges. I got to deal with me. And I don't know how in the world anybody deals with himself without Jesus. So go with me to Luke 15. I want to show you something in Luke, then something in Matthew, then something in, 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 in Mark, Luke, and John. No, I'm just kidding. T two places I want to go, and I'm almost done. Go with me to, we're going to start in Luke 15. Oh, hallelujah. Everybody there? Verse number. Ah. Uh, yeah. 11. A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to the father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto him his living. He wasted everything with riotous living, verse 13. Spent all that he had, verse 14. Famine hit the land, verse 14. Verse 15, he was eaten with our pig. Well, not our pig, but you get the point. Verse 15 and 16 said he was eaten just like the pigs. That's swine in the, New, in the King James Bible. Verse 17, he came to himself. Oh, my goodness. I'm about to run off this platform. Lord, thank God for these 1130 services. This clock can't stop me. Watch this. Would you read that first part up to that comma in verse 17 out loud? And when he came to himself. Oh, read it again. And when he came to himself. When did he come to himself? When he was eating something lower than the standard that he had got at his father's house. Then none speak to us like food. What we eat reflects where we are. So I won't forget it. What we eat reflects where we are. This boy's food was a reflection of where he was. And guess what it did? It made him remember what he used to eat. Oh, my soul. He came to himself by what he was eating. And I want you to know, those of you that are here, watch this live stream, no matter where you are in life, what are you eating right now mentally? What are you eating right now spiritually? What are you eating right now physically? Because I'm here to tell you that your Father in heaven has a love for you, and he has bread to feed you with, spiritual bread. He has food to give you that will nourish you and sustain you and give you life. Why eat from the gutter when you can eat from the king's table? But we don't always mentally feed on the right stuff. We feed on negativity. We feed on offense. We feed on the past. We feed on social media. We feed on music and videos that help us remember the victims we are and how bad we've been treated and how wronged we are have been and, 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 and serve our emotion and our flesh. He came to himself. He came to himself by what he was eating. I had a dear family in my life many, many years ago. And they had three children, and they invited me out to eat one day. And we went out to eat. It was Applebee's. And we were out there eating. And I was seated next to the, to, to the, the uh, brother, dear friend, uh, husband, father of the, of the children. And, and they set the ticket on the table right here. 
I'm a single man, four marriage and all that, you understand? And they set the ticket on the table, like right here, like I'm gonna pay you. <laughs> you know, I, I, I couldn't help it, I just happened to see it. It was like 90 something dollars, I don't know. Back then that would have been cheap compared to now, man. You try to feed, what, one, two, three, five, six people now, $190, but anyway. I look down and I'm like, oh! He wasn't even my ticket to pay. He was paying the ticket. But I'm like, oh, there go my wife. There go my children. <laughs> I'm being real. I was like, I can't have kids. I can't get married. I can't afford no $91 of Applebee's. I'm eating off Taco Bell back when they had a 99 cent menu. And they don't have that no more. I went in there the other day, ordered me something quick because they had chicken and I needed some chicken. And they said me $9.30. I'm like, $9? I'm at Taco Bell. I was like, now that Taco Bell is high, we have no hope. <laughs> you can't even get a bag of chips for under $3 right now. I mean, it's hard time spreading just like the flu. Look out, on boy. Don't let it get you. <laughs> That's Woodlawn. <laughs> he said, I'm glad you know what I'm talking about. Somebody's like, what is he talking about? 90s, you go back. All right. I looked at that ticket, I was like, oh man, I can't get married and have kids. I get a $191 meal at Applebee's. What you eat reflects where you are. Huh? The man is eating with the swine. And the Bible says in verse 17, read it again out loud, Shreveport Bosia. And when he came to himself, it's what you feed on that ought to remind you where you were. The children of Israel were in Egypt, and what they were feeding on was different. It was, it was so far from what God wanted to give them. They've been eating leftovers, and God has for them daily bread. So he came to himself, and in verse 17, he said, how many hired servants of my father have bread enough to spare, and I'm perishing with hunger? Notice what drove him back home. Bread. I will arise and go to my father and say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. I just want some of that bread. I just want some of that bread. And I'm thinking about bread like at Logan's Steakhouse. Man, that's some bread. Have you ever had them rolls at Logan's? Good grief. Man, that's some bread. Hot. Buttery, soft, sweet. I like that bread so much. We got through eating. We were there last night. I ate so much. I cleaned my plate off, had me some green beans. The only thing left was the green bean juice. And I said, this bread is so good, it needs to be sopped. But I ain't got nothing else to sop it in. I stuck it in my green bean juice, and my girl's like, Daddy. I was like, I can't help it. I got that sauce in there. Good bread demands some sopping. You better not talk about you dip it in the gravy, you dip it in the turkey juice, whatever it is. Man, you gotta dip that stuff. <laughs> well, this man's thinking about that bread. He's like, oh, I gotta get back. I gotta get back to that good buttered bread. I gotta get back. I gotta get back. He goes back to his daddy's house, and he said in verse 21, Father, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned in your sight. I'm not even worthy to be called your son. Got some bread. <laughs> I already I said it because we know that's what was in his heart. That, that's what he said. He said, I got to go back. I got to tell him all this because he, they, they eat good bread over there. I got to eat. I'm, I'm tired of this. He had to recognize not only what he needed saved from, but what he could be saved to. Ah! Jesus not only saved me from my sin and my mess, he saved me to his daily bread. He saved me to his presence. He saved me to a life with him where I have a relationship with the all-seeing, all-knowing, all-powerful God.
He said, I gotta go back home. I gotta confess my mess. And so when the father heard it, this is so good, I can't hardly stand it. I'm being real, I didn't preach this twice already today. I, it's so good, I can't hardly stand it the third time. Watch this. The father, the father said, look in verse 22. The father said, give me the best robe. Put it on him. He done hocked his ring. Give me another one. <laughs> I don't know what he did with his ring. But back in the day, man, you need a little money. Hey, you go down to pawn shop. <laughs> Spent $1,000 on that ring. He left there with $50. And said, give me some shoes for his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf. Kill it. Let us eat. Let us eat. Read that out loud. Let us eat and do what? Be merry. We're going to have a feast. A feast for who? A feast for one that smelled bad. A feast for one that looked bad. A feast for one that had been in bondage. A feast for one that gave himself completely to the world. And the only thing he was left with was the same food the swine was eating. He's lost his ring. He's lost his coat. He's lost his, his, his life. And in, in that place of brokenness and bondage to himself, he realizes the only hope he has is with his father. And so he comes back to the father. And what does the father say? You low down and filthy dirty son You should have never done me the way you did me Now hit the road Jack Don't you come back No he said come on in son Give me another robe to put on him Give me another ring to put on him Give me some shoes for his feet Somebody play the string instrument Somebody break out the music Pull out the chair Set my son at my table And bring on in the bread He was dead but he's back Let's have a feast Hey, he's a picture of what God did to the children of Israel in Egypt. Where did he get his new shoes? At the table. Where did he get his new robe? At the table. Where did he get his new gold ring? At the table. Where did he get restored? At the table. And his old brother come in there talking about, what's the music playing for? Where's Winston? <laughs> Woo! He says, son, your brother, my son, was dead. But now he's alive. He was lost. But now he's found. We're having a celebration. The religious crowd don't understand that. Oh, man, this is heavy. One more verse. Turn with me to the other one I told you. Matthew 15. Welcome to the 1130 service. We just go ahead and get it all out. Watch this. Matthew 15. I'm almost done. I'll have you out here by 2.30. Just stay home. <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Watch this. I'm almost done. Watch this. Watch this. I'm going to be real with you. Man. I'm going to be real with you. Being real with you, and I blow my nose. That's being real right there. I'm telling you, right? Ain't no more real than that. Preacher, something be real when you blow his nose. That's it. He's real. Listen to that man. Right? That's a man of God with a D. We need to know that we're all doing this thing called life. And we all need the grace of God and sometimes just a crumb off his table. Oh, man, I'm about to show it to you in the Word. If y'all be gracious to me, I want to tell a quick, quick little testimony. Friday, for me, was like the end of a very difficult week for me. 
It's all relative, because if you had heard about your week, I'd say, man, I was living heaven on earth. It's all relative. But in my world, it was rough. And I was feeling a lot of anxiety and pressure and stress and just not healthy. And on the way to school that morning, Milo, I hope you don't mind me telling this story. Milo was not herself completely. I could tell she was heavy. Because Mila, we have four kids. Mila's one of them ones that just would get me even when the others might not get me. We were out after eating last night in a store. And I can't tell you what went down, but it's hilarious. And I said and did something to my wife that she didn't even get, but Mila got it. And she laughed so hard she had to lay down on the floor in the store. She lay in there like, ah, and I'm like, she gets me. I wish, I wish I could tell you what happened. I can't. There ain't no way on TV I'm going to tell you what to do. It's funny, though. It's funny. And so this ain't Milo. Milo's heavy. Friday, she's heavy. She's in the back seat, ain't talking, and all of we're clowning and making goo goo eyes at each other and laughing. I mean, we just kind of operate on a little wavelength. She ain't there. She look anxious. And so I'm, I went from laughing to crying, man. I'm thinking, man, I hope I hadn't rubbed off on her. I hope the heaviness of my week hadn't done transferred to my kids. I was literally thinking that. I was like, I'm to blame for this. You know, she's heavy, and I've been heavy all week, and, and, and I'm not being the covering I need to be for my family. And I told my wife this Friday or Saturday. I think it was Friday. And so we pull up here at the school, and she said, well, I got this major test today that I don't think I'm prepared for. And she was so heavy about this test. And I said, Mila, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. I said, Mila, the Bible says the memory of the just is blessed. And the Holy Spirit's going to bring to remembrance everything you've heard. And he's going to perfect what concerns you. And in the name of Jesus, he's going to go with you in this test. And we just prayed. She got out the vehicle and went on inside. As a couple hours later, we get a group text on family text. It's Mila text us all. She said, 40 out of 40, ace the test. It's not just what we've been saved from. It's a father that hears big prayers, little prayers, every prayer that, that perfects what concerns us that's there. Even if it's our child being anxious over a test, he's there. He's an ever-present, loving, merciful, good, and gracious God. And I cannot imagine doing life without him. Not because I have it all together as a father or a husband. Not because of what I look like or what title comes before or after my name. In my mess, in my own depression, in my own anxiety, in my own mental bondage, he still says, let him go, let him go, let him go. And he has the power to release me from whatever has my mind in bondage. Why? So that I can eat the bread of his presence. Eat the bread of his goodness. Last thing I want to read, we're done. Still going to be out here by 1 o'clock. It's all right. Watch this in Matthew 15. If you're there, say amen. Verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast. And cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. This was all a setup. God always knows what he's doing. He's setting something up. He knew what he was going to do, but he sees this is set up. His disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away. She's crying after us now. He answered and said, I am not sent but under the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered and said, it's not me. Gives this little analogy, this parable. It's not me to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. And look at what this woman did. She said, truth, Lord. 
Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table, which means even the dog benefits from the bread at the table. What you're eating is a reflection of where you are. And she said, I may not be of the house of Israel, and I not have any rights to sit at your table, but even a dog can come grab crumbs. And I'm, I'm, I'm laying here worshiping you at your table, not seated at your table, but I'm, at the, I'm on the floor at your table, and I'm just saying, let me have a crumb. And he looked back, and he answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. What am I saying? That even a crumb that falls from his table is more than enough. Just being there is more than enough. God has everything I need. Even a crumb from his table can change my life forever. How much more being seated at the table? It's not just what I've been saved from. It's what I've been saved to. Let me pray with you this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. And I ask by your spirit, Father, right now that you would help all of us to see that what we eat is a reflection of where we are. Church, meditate on that just for a minute. What we eat is a reflection of where we are. God said, I'm bringing them out of Egypt to eat my bread. Daily bread. Manna. Bread that'll make you say what? Salvation is not just what we've been saved from. It's what we've been saved to, and that's his presence. I don't know what might be standing between you and his presence or what your own Egypt looks like. But he has the power to deliver. (laughs) He does. His name is Jehovah Shammah. He is a God that is present. And Egypt's gates couldn't keep him out. And Pharaoh's heart couldn't couldn't stop Jehovah from showing up in the land of Egypt. There's nothing in your life more powerful than him. Oh, hallelujah. He's stronger than any addiction. He's stronger than your past. He's stronger than the skeletons in your closet. Thank you, Jesus. He came to save us from our sins into a life of his presence. It's available to anybody that'll call on him. I invite you to pray with me right now. It's not my prayers that save. I'm just a man. I bring a message. The message is the gospel. The message is Jesus. And I'm gonna lead you in a prayer that's based on faith and who he is. My faith can't save you. Your faith can. Faith not in a man, not in a church. A faith in Jesus. I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, I acknowledge my Egypt. The areas I've been in bondage, the bondage of sin, selfishness, my flesh. I believe your word. That even in my Egypt, you save me, you come to me, you deliver me. 
So I ask for forgiveness and that you would redeem me from my bondage. And I ask in faith not only to be saved from myself, my past, my mess, my sins, but I want to know you. I want to know your presence. The life you have for me. Help me to remember that what I eat is a reflection of where I am. And I want to eat from your table. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Can we clap unto the Lord this morning? He's worthy, amen. <laughs> On both campuses down front, you'll see many women of faith. They're prayer ministers. They want to pray with you this morning. That's what they're here for. You just come forward. They're not going to try to get you to join the church or take you in the back room. They're going to pray with you. That's it. If you need prayer, you come forward. Let's stand together. New series, Lord willing, starting this Wednesday. Don't miss it, 630. If you need prayer on either campus, just come forward. Otherwise, you can be dismissed. I love you. Have a blessed week. Hope to see you here Wednesday night, 630 p.m.